guess you're ready to go here. So hopefully you took the first quiz. I saw a lot of people did. And uh, if you did not take the first quiz and you need more time for it, let me know. I'll make a list of people like that and uh, give you more time at this point. I may have to start putting some kind of penalty on it if a lot of people start doing that. But it looks like most people are taking the quizzes on time, and that's my only concern for the moment. So we're down to, I think, Chapter 2. Let me just check and make sure I'm not getting confused. Today is 9.12, and it should be Chapter 2. All right, good. So, all right. So in the old days, there was a host.txt file, which is still present on your machine, except doesn't have .txt anymore. In um, C, Windows driver etc, and in Windows and slash etc, there's a host file, which has a list of mappings of server names to IP addresses. And you can still put mappings in there, and they will affect your DNS resolution. Your machine will look in there before it uses external DNS. And some people have internet accelerator utilities that put special addresses in there, and some people have spam blockers to block up or to block dangerous websites that put the entries in there to block in them somewhere where you won't see anything like 127.0.0.1. So it's still on there, but originally that's all there was. And they would actually mail floppy disks around or something with this hosts file on it. And that's how you'd update the small number of servers that were on the internet. But of course, as the internet grew, that became ridiculous and too difficult. And so they switched in 1983 to DNS. And so the point here was, uh, you wanted to have a distributed storage system so there were copies of the data all over the place. So no one of them would go down and there would always be one operation near where you are. And so each server could just store some small portion of the database, like all the addresses at your company. And uh, you could then, everybody on the whole internet would have, hopefully easily find some DNS server to look up these addresses on. So they made this hierarchical name. You have a top-level domain, .edu, and originally there were only seven of them, com, net, mil, edu, and a few others. And um, then you'd have your company name here, and then you'd have a host name here. So you could refer to a server name at your company, at your type of company, and that would be what's called a fully qualified domain name that specifies all the way down to one server. And these are the parts, the host name, the second-level domain, and the top-level domain. That's the game. And so now you have a hierarchical namespace. At the top of it all is root, and the only thing in root is a list of where the top-level domain servers are. So if you want to go to something .com, like yahoo.com, you ask root, where is com? And then you ask com, now that you know where it is, where is yahoo.com's name server? And you go down to yahoo.com's name server, and you ask them, where is www.yahoo.com? And they tell you. And that's how you find it. So it should take maybe three or four queries to find out anything you want to know. And most of the time it takes much less because you have caching resolvers that remember what's been resolved recently and they only have to refresh that every time the cache runs out. So popular websites, you have a local copy anyway. So they call these things DNS zones. You've, so it's typically what's owned by one company. So CCSF has a variety of servers like www and name servers and mail servers and whatever else you might have here. And that's all part of the CCSF zone. So we call the zone all the uh, groups of uh, servers that we're, over, we're controlling from one administrative point, typically. And then you can have domain delegation if you want to. We could split up the campuses. We could have ocean.ccsf.edu and mission and evans.ccsf.edu. We have not done that at this college, but I know I mean, it's just a matter of internal campus politics. I think it's Evergreen. I met the administrator from Evergreen, and he told me that Evergreen, someplace in, in East Bay, they've got like, like we do, they've got like 12 campuses, but they decided that each campus had to have a separate identity and have a separate domain controller and be a separate forest. Microsoft domains. So they may have a different DNS for each campus, and they have to make it like this. And you can handle either way. That was just to make a political statement that one of them is not subservient to the others or anything. But anyway, it's an issue, and especially as companies merge and split, which they do all the time, you get a lot of this stuff. Um, so that's the game. So in this case, if you go to CCSF's main name server and you ask it where is www.mission.ccsf, it will say, I don't know, go ask Mission. And the mission will tell you where it is. And that's domain delegation. So you can tell, you can forward the request to another domain. And we'll see that next time can be used to make some entertaining uh, attacks on DNS, where you make it go through a long, long chain of forwarding. So it has to do a lot of queries to resolve it. All right. 
So your client is your machine like a web browser that's trying to find something from an alphabetical name. The server is some place server running a DNS service that's storing a database and handing out the data. And a resolver is the software that takes the query from your client and finds the answer. That's typically what runs in your router. Your router is not actually a DNS server. It doesn't store anything except a cache. It is a forwarder. It takes the query and it goes and finds the answer and brings it back to you. All right, so DNS servers. There are different kinds of servers out there. Uh, the authoritative server is the one that must be present. Every domain has to have somebody who has the final answer. And this is really important for negative queries. If you look for fred.ccsf.edu and there is no fred.ccsf.edu, getting an authoritative denial of service is a big issue. How, who can really be sure that there is no Fred? I can ask servers and they can say, I don't know about Fred. And they can say, Fred's not in my cache. But who is qualified to tell me there is no Fred, quit looking? That would be the authoritative server for that domain. So that's the one who you can, the start of authority, you can ask them, and if they tell you they don't have it, that's it, you can quit looking, because it would have to be there. Now, all over the internet, at every company and all over the place, you have caching servers, which your company will have one of these that you use, your ISP will provide it, if a Comcast or somebody, where they will just cache resolution, because of course, everybody goes to Google every 10 seconds. So there's no point asking the google.com name server 10 times a second where it is. You just want to ask it about once an hour or once a day in case it changes. And all the rest of the time, everybody that goes to Google just gets told the answer we told the last guy from the cache. That will make it faster and cheaper and easier for everybody. So you have a cached record. And when you put the record in your start of authority server, you specify the TTL, which is how long people should cache this record before they ask me again. So if you are a stable business and you figure you're not going to move anything for a long time, you turn this up to a long time, like a day. Just ask me once a day. If you think you're going to be moving to another host frequently for some reason, you can make that cache record smaller, like five minutes. And then it'll keep asking your authoritative server every five minutes if the record is still fresh. But then if you do move it, it'll only be five minutes or maybe a couple multiples of five minutes before everybody gets the new address. And as we'll see, and I mentioned last time, if you are a crook and you're running something like a command and control server and you're sending out stuff like malware and spam that is leading to huge abuse reports, you know that your server is going to get taken down pretty soon because you've hacked somebody's server and you're doing something rotten with it. So you turn this way down to like 30 seconds so you can keep hopping from server to server as they fall out underneath you, as the, bad, as the good guys are trying to hunt down your server and, and kill it. So a recursive query is what you normally use. If you go to a browser and type in a name like ccsf.edu, you do a recursive query, which means you just want to get the answer. You ask your router, typically, like the router on City College, you ask it, where is where's, uh, google.com? And it will either tell you if it knows, and if it doesn't know, it will then ask other people until it does know and tell you. So your computer will have the sense that it only had to ask one person to get the answer. That's a recursive query. The server will then keep doing more queries as necessary to find the answer. An iterative query is the other way. You ask a server, where is Google? And it, if it says, I don't know, that's it. You still don't know. Now you have to go ask somebody else. The iterative query makes you do all the work, which is not what normal end users want. But it is what you want for other purposes, like, for example, DNS cache snooping. Suppose there is something I do not want people doing at my company. Like I say, no Facebook. That's our policy. We hate you wasting time on Facebook. Nobody in the company should be going to Facebook. Well, I could do an iterative query to our name server on Facebook, and that would tell me if Facebook is in the cache. And if it is, that means somebody went to Facebook. And if it's not, that means nobody in the whole enterprise went to Facebook in the last few minutes. So that's one of the cases in which you'd use an iterative query. All right, and here's a DNS forwarder. Um, this is one that will just cache more records. So it goes to this forwarder, which will then send iterative queries up here. And the forwarder can cache things. It's just another way to limit your traffic if you're in an area where you have to pay a lot for a lot of bandwidth going to different locations. All right, and like I say, there are DNS resolvers. Receive requests from client applications. They then query the DNS servers. And there's stub resolvers. Our resolver is connected to one recursive server. Um, all right. 
the Windows Stub Resolver is part of your operating system, and the Windows Resolver caches DNS records. You have to do ipconfig slash flush DNS to clean it out. So if you do get a bad DNS result, it can linger on in your, for some period in your machine. Um, but it also means that if you go to google.com and then a minute later you go to google.com again, you don't even send any DNS queries at all out. You have it in the local cache in the RAM of that machine. It already knows where Google is. If you're on Linux, that does not happen. There's no caching. If you open another browser tab and type in a second tab with google.com, it will do a fresh DNS query to find where google.com is. It's just a decision of the designers of the operating system not to cache DNS. All right, so your internet service provider gives you an IP address to use, and they give you a DNS server to use. It all comes as part of your service. Um, and if you put your own home router in and have many machines share it, then you're going to have um, local addresses like 192.168 down here, and they're all going to use DNS service from your router, which will just forward it to the address of your internet service provider. So here's a typical name resolution scenario. I'm on a machine. I, op I open up my browser. That's my stub resolver. And I say, where is www.ccs.edu? It will ask my resolver. The resolver, if it knows, it will tell me. If it doesn't know, it will ask, if, um, it will look for the authoritative server, CCSF. If it can't, doesn't know that, it will look for EDU. If it doesn't know that, it will ask root, where is EDU? Now, it's very likely to know some of those things, but if I've just rebooted it and it's forgotten everything it knows, then it will have to ask the dot, where is edu, and ask edu, where is ccsf.edu, and then ask the name server for ccsf, where is the particular device you want. So it will take three queries in a normal case for it to figure out where something is, but the end user will never know that. They send one query, and a, a fraction of a second later comes the answer, when everything's working right. All right, uh, now there's another issue. Because um, you do not want to have just one name server. This used to be a common practice maybe 10 years ago, but of course, as anybody could tell you, if you have just one name server, what happens when it goes down? What happens when someone attacks it? Then you're hosed. Your whole company vanishes from the internet pretty soon. As soon as the caches are empty, nobody can find any of your stuff. So you want to have a master server with the master copy of it, and then slave servers that have duplicate copies, just there to handle the load and take over if one of them goes down. So. The uh, process of moving data from a master server to a slave server is called zone transfers. And it's part of the DNS protocol. You can do a request for a zone transfer, and then it will take all the data in a zone, which is everything at your company typically, and move it to another server. It could be a large database, but that's how you update servers. And in a spirit of analogy, this is the same term Microsoft uses for replication of domain controllers. If you put up a domain controller, then you put up a second domain controller, you do what they call a zone transfer, where it takes all the data from the first one and puts it on the second one so they can now both resolve logins and other searches on your network, like Active Directory. So the root servers are dot. Um, this is the top of the whole tree. It just has a short file of data which has pointers to all the other top-level domains. This used to be very small. It got a lot larger about five years ago when they relaxed the limitation on the number of top-level domains. Now, they, this was pretty much a failure, but the problem was there was a thing called typo squatting. If you had some reason to think that somebody was going to have an internet presence, but they didn't have one yet, like um, Obama is going to run for president, but he hasn't thought of putting up a website yet, you could buy Obama.com, Obama.net, Obama.gov. Well, you can't get gov, but you can come and net. And then you can get ObamaForPresident.com. And then when he comes around to buy that domain, it's not there. And he has to pay whatever you want to charge him, like a million bucks for it. And if that's not enough, you could put up a really insulting or offensive website there that really bothers people that are looking for him to try to motivate him to pay whatever you cost to let go of that domain. So to fix this problem, they authorized more top-level domains, which completely failed because um, they asked average people after this is over. Yeah, after, first, they put out domains like .info, like mine. And they found out that normal people, 90% of normal people, will not go to any domain that doesn't end in .com. If it ends in anything else, they say, that's probably bogus, that's a spam site, that's not a legitimate company. And not only is that a perception normal people have, the reason people have that perception is because it's true. 99% of the domains ending in like .info or something are in fact crooked domains sending out malware and stuff. So um, it turned out that the attempt to fix the problem totally did not work. For all practical purposes, there's only one domain called .com, which is the only one anybody trusts. And uh, 
if you get anything else, you're kind of wasting your time. Now you can get a dot horse and dot sucks and all kinds of things, but very few people are going to ever go there. If you have a business, everyone expects to take your business name dot com, should be your real website, and if you don't have it, they figure there's something wrong with you. Why don't you get that site? Anyway, um, all right. There are hundreds of servers participating to make the root. They're dispersed all around the world. And in fact, Cloudflare just joined the gang. They were part of the F root server. And since they joined, they made it twice as fast. It went from a delay of eight milliseconds down to four milliseconds. They had a blog post about it a couple days ago. Because Cloudflare is a huge network. They, they moved last, I heard a couple of years ago, they were moving 10% of all the traffic on the internet through Cloudflare's network. It's probably more by now. So they're huge. And when they joined the root, that's a considerable contribution to the power of the root. And so, there are 13 domain names here, a, b, up to m.rootservers.net, and each one of those is an anycast network where the same IP is on many machines around the whole world. So it's not just 13 servers. It's 13 domains, each of them leading to hundreds of servers. That's why it's so hard to take it down. Yeah? Does the company get anything for that? Any no. Feedback, or do they just do it out of the Yeah, they pretty much do it as a... Uh, uh, asset to the internet. Um, a lot of these big companies do that. They donate something. Google donates a lot of things to the internet. And, um, you know, in, indirectly they get something. They get public goodwill, they get better people work for them, and they get to brag about it at conferences, and more customers can more successfully access sites, so the internet is more successful. But, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of altruism on the internet. There's a whole lot of uh, companies that do things for free that's, and have a certain profit, non-profit motive. Um, that's, you know, the internet started as sort of a hippie kind of uh, benefit to the world. It started out as a research project. It wasn't intended to make money at all. And even when it was sold to telephone companies to make commercial, a whole lot of people maintained an internet ethic that you should just be nice to people and stuff. And, you know, so there's some of that still around, plus a whole lot of nasty scamming and crime and political and bickering and sexual harassment and horrible things going on in addition to all that. So, I got some cahoots to do. Let me bring them up. Go to kahoot.it and put in the number 686155. I'm reading it out loud. People tell me I should, for, and I'm working in this room where there's a 30 second delay. 686155 for people watching the stream. There they are, S seven players. Okay, now I'm thinking we might have everybody that's coming. All right. So what system performed name resolution before DNS? All right, and that's host the host file. And if you people are having trouble seeing it, there's chairs in the front if you want to move. But anyway, you know this won't be too long. All right, which one of these is a TLD? Info, the last bit at the end, that's the top level domain. All right. Which of these is an FQDN? www.chamsclass.info, that's fully qualified. All right. What device stores all the DNS records for Zone? That's the server. The DNS server has that. All right. You add a new server to a domain. Where should you put its DNS record?
All right, that's the start of authority. That's the point of it. That's the place where new information goes, and it will then replicate to the other servers from there. All right, I think there's one more. Yep. So what process copies all the records from one server to another? Okay, that's the zone transfer. Good. All right. How can there be only two winners? Maybe I'll hit get results. Okay. Um, I'll take the top three. It's all right, anyway. All right. We will carry on. So let's go back to the slides. All right. So we'll talk about the record types. These things are called resource records the data lines that you put on a DNS server, and here's the common types. There really are quite a few. The most common type by far is the A record. That is just the simple address record. It's using the name of a server, it tells you what its IP version 4 address is. Almost all the time, that's what you want. These days, some people are using IP version 6, mostly people in France and Comcast customers, but it is getting up to maybe 10 or 20 percent of the traffic on the internet is IP version 6, so in that case you use a quad A record to get the IPv6 address for the server. And as time goes on over the next decade, this will become more common and that will become less common and eventually this will be gone in probably about 20 years. But in the meantime, we're going to have both of them in use everywhere as all the hardware gradually changes over to the newer system. MX is for mail exchangers, places to send SMTP mail. Um, PTR records are pointer records. These are used for reverse name lookups, where you change an IP address and go back to a domain name, which would not normally be necessary, but in fact has become very important to block spam. So if somebody sends you some mail, one common thing you do is look at the from address and then go check the IP address it came from and see if it really came from that company. And if it's lying about where it came from, then it's probably spam and you want to throw it away. Uh, NS tells you where the um, name servers are. In particular, um, the SOA is one of the NS records. And CNAME is a canonical name. You can have a name that resolves to another name. For a while, City College originally was not an EDU. The original rules said only four-year colleges got the EDUs. So we were not at EDU, we were a um, .NET, I think, and we also we had .cc, .ca, .us, which is Community College California US. And when we, then uh, the ICANN, which handles this, ICANN is an organization to handle the names and addresses on the internet, and they are fantastically corrupt and incompetent. They keep getting sued by their own members, the board will quit and default. They'll do things like take a company, that's doing business and suddenly sell your domain name to somebody else without your consent to kill your business when there's no reason for this at all and then lie about it. It's just amazing. So one of the many things they did was they gave some two-year college an EDU. And after this came to light, instead of taking it back from them, they just gave it to every other college too. That's how we got it. That was their idea of how to solve the problem. Which, you know, anyway, for better or worse, ICANN is still doing it. Um, but they have many, many scandals. They're a very troubled organization. Anyway, here's the start of authority. Um, which gives you information about the zone, and there's text information, so you can just put anything you want up on, the, on your DNS. You can use DNS to store other information if you want to, and there are various extensions that use those records. And when we get into DNSSEC and modern security options, you'll see even more. Uh, here's a few more, naming authority pointer, a service record for other kinds of service that might use DNS. Sender policy framework is another anti-spam solution. There are unfortunately about three or four different anti-spam solutions all running at once on the internet. Um, not all agreed to. And here's the ones for DNSSEC. DNS key, DS, RRSIG, and NSEC. We'll talk a lot more about them later. Those are the long cryptographic records that make it possible to sign DNS records so you can tell if they came from an authoritative server and they have not been altered. To try to add some security to DNS, because it was designed with none, really. Like most internet protocols, the only concern was to make it work at all, and to resist hackers deliberately trying to mess with it was not a big design feature. So let's, let's take a look at some of this stuff and see what we can find out about CCSF. Let me shrink this down and bring up a command prompt. Okay, let's get out of this Python. 
and all right clear all right so if i do dig um ccsf let's do um www.ccsf.edu and talk about what happens here okay since i didn't specify a server it's going to look for my default dns server which on my machine is set to 8888 which is google's public dns server so it asked google where this thing was www.ccsf.edu it asked it give me an internet address of type a since i didn't specify anything that's the default so it asked and um, it found out that www.ccsf.edu is a canonical name for cloud.ccsf.edu. So this is a fine example. You don't get an answer. Instead, it had to do two questions. This name is not actually a fully qualified domain name. It's a canonical name. It has to be translated to this, which is the actual fully qualified domain name of our server. And when you ask where that is, there's the address. It takes two steps to find the actual address. So if you can do this if you want to have multiple names for your servers. Um, but it does mean technically that people going to your site is a little bit slower by a fraction of a second. But people do it all the time, like when you put a website, you put on uh, uh, 203 redirects to redirect from my old page to my new page, and people will leave them up for years because it really doesn't matter. It just means there's an extra couple requests required to get to your site. Now, if I want to see more, I can put a type of record here like AAAA, and then I will find out that there is um, a canonical name, and here's the authority, but there is no quad A record. So I got an answer, and the answer is this canonical name, but it didn't find the record. Now let's see if I can find a quad A address for that canonical name, which is cloud.ccsf. I think I won't, or it would have been included. And here you find the sad fact, our college has not upgraded to IPv6. We do not have an IPv6 address. If you have an IPv6 only device, you can't see the college. This is not a problem right now because very few people are using IPv6 only devices, but that time will come when we have to upgrade our stuff. But we haven't done it yet. And let's see if we can get everything. People are beginning to deprecate this query, but there used to be one people used a lot called dig any that just says tell me everything about that. And it looks like they have deprecated it here to where you don't get very much. All you're getting is the A record. Um, but we have more things. We have mail exchanges. Let's try that. We have a name servers. Here's mail exchanges. Uh, thought we had one, but maybe not. Oh, that's right. We switched to Gmail. And so our mail exchanges are outsourced to Gmail. So I guess we're not going to see anything here anymore. Let's try name servers. We must have some of those. All right. And um, there's the authority section. There's the answer. No, no name servers. How rude. Well, there has to be an SOA. Oh, because I'm not, that's the problem. I'm using cloud here. All right. Let's go back to mail exchanges. We probably have them. Okay, now I feel better. There we are. We do have a mail exchange. This is for the faculty mail. ccsfedu.mail going to outlook.com because the faculty mail is outsourced to Microsoft and the student mail is outsourced to Gmail. That's the way we are. And let's try name servers now. This will work better. We got to have those. There we go. These are the ones I expected to see. Our internet service provider is Scenic. You might have Comcast or AT&T, but if you're a California community college, you get Scenic for free, which is a special ISP just for colleges, and it is really great. They're super fast and free. They told us they'll give us any speed we can handle. So we had uh, one gigabit per second connection to the internet for years, and this semester I was just talking to Tim Ryan, who's coming to give a talk tomorrow night about the City College Network, which is very interesting, actually. And one of the many things I found out is now we have two 10 gigabyte per second connections to the internet share. So you download a file here, it's fast. The only reason it's only one gigabit is because our local area networks are only up to one gigabit. But if you had somehow to get a 10 gigabit connection brought in, connected directly to the fiber out of your backbone, I guess we could be downloading stuff at 10 gigs here. But that would be expensive. Anyway, let me try any. It might work now that I'm not specifying a fully qualified domain name there. Yeah, there we go. All right. So let me shrink this down a bit to see. All right. So here's what I wanted to show you, the complexity of a real DNS record. Let me make it fit on the screen as best I can. That's pretty good. Okay. So here's the game. You've got um, a mail exchanger here for the Outlook mail. We've got some text records here with Amazon information. Here's the Center Protection Framework center policy framework, which is used for email for that Outlook. It looks like this is for Outlook, and we have some Amazon SES. I don't know what that is. Amazon Mail or something. I have no clue. Um, 
if we have some kind of Adobe text record, and here's some kind of Base64 encoded text record, those are various services. This is probably cloud services that we're associated with that expect us to have a record here. Um, here's the name server, the A record, here's the start of authority, NS3, and so you go. So like I said, the SOA record has information about your domain, and it has these numbers here, which specify, among other things, when it was last updated and how long to cache records. One of those is the how long to cache it in seconds. And we'll, oh, we'll go back to the slides and we'll talk more about those. All right. By the way, if you do, let me do IETF because that's also worth seeing. If I go to IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, and these are, these are the people that write the specifications for most of these things, theirs should be a lot bigger. And, oh, it's IETF.org. There, and that's the reason I did that is because I wanted to show you the joy of DNSSEC. The first thing to notice is the answer is much, much bigger. And it is bigger because now you have a start of authority, which is the same thing you might have got from City College. It's some kind of root domain name and then some timing parameters. And then you've got a signature to justify it. And then you've got a signature for the SPF and the SPF, you got a signature for DNS key and so on. You have all these long signature records. So the total amount of data that comes is much larger, but you could cryptographically verify the data now to know that you're getting accurate data. And we'll talk about this more. This is like IP version 6. This is an improvement on the internet that has been very, very slow to roll out. And right now, there is no browser you can put on your machine that verifies any of this. It, it helps some of the servers on the internet actually verify the, the uh, DNS check signatures, but most of them don't. So right now, it is just in its infancy and not actually doing anybody much good. But someday, in the distant future, when everyone deploys it, it'll be possible to have more trust in the DNS records you get. So there's the start of authority for City College, which is ns3.ccsf.edu, and there's other information there about it. And if you put it in multi-line with dig, then it'll tell you what it is. So here's the serial number of the update, which you can see is sort of like a um, Equifax pin. It's just the date and then a number. Um, here's the refresh time, the retry time, expire, and minimum time, uh, various time parameters that have to do with how long this thing will be cached on other servers. All right. Uh, by the way, it is fairly common that your internet service provider or your company does not allow unlimited DNS queries. For example, if they only allow you to do the oldest version of DNS over UDP, you cannot possibly get these long signatures. So you won't get them from your company. Because since nobody's enforcing it anyway, you don't really need them. So often, and if you go to Starbucks, you will get the weirdest answers if you try to do any of this homework at Starbucks. Starbucks greatly messes with DNS. You can surf normal websites there, but when you try to do more advanced internet things, you get weird answers. So if you get tired of trying to cope with whatever weird restrictions on DNS you have, you go to a looking glass, like the Ring of Saturn. There are people out there that just put up servers where they will query DNS for you and let you see the results. So you're not limited by the limitations of your network. And so here's a place you can go if you ever have trouble doing your homework, and you'll find this in the homework links. You can do the DNS homework on somebody's looking glass for the ones where you're trying these different queries and seeing the different kind of records, so that's much better. Because a lot of DNS, a lot of internet service doesn't really give you all the services. They block things for various reasons. So, all right, then there's reverse DNS resolution. Like I say, you might start with an IP address and go down to a domain name, which is not going to help you reach a server from a domain name, but it's going to help you verify that something you got came from the right address. And that's usually done for uh, spam email. So those are pointer records, and the way you put it in here, for some reason, is you take the IP address and put it backwards, and then at the end you put dot in adder dot ARPA. There is probably some sophisticated intellectual reason why this makes sense. To me, it just looks backwards. And believe me, in IP version 6, it's really screwy, looking backwards. But anyway, that's what the record actually looks like to make it possible to do a reverse lookup. And... Uh, all right, so here's a reverse DNS lookup. What you do is dig minus X on an IP address, and then it will look for who owns that IP address, and here it will tell you that's apparently um, rev.c4110.gnu.org. That's the name of that thing. So you can do a reverse lookup. All right, here's a forward lookup for Google. I look for Google's quad A record, 
and I get an IP version 6 address. IP version 6 addresses look like that. They're much longer than IP version 4 addresses, and they're in hexadecimal. And uh, Google is a very much a leader in IP version 6. They jumped right on it right away. They have advanced features. Unlike City College, they jumped right on it. We haven't upgraded yet, but they have. And so they've got one. And uh, there's a reverse lookup for Google. So if I do a dig minus X on an IPv6 address, 2607FVD0, this is what it looks like, 2607FVD0. Really looks like mess. You have to make records like that for a verse lookup. Like I say, somebody, if you read the RFCs, which go to hundreds of pages, there's probably some brilliant reason for this, but it sure looks screwy to me. All right. So here's how it looks. You've got the root, you've got .com and .net, and then here you've got ARPA. And ARPA's got inner for internet addresses, and down here it's got 10, 20, 30, and 40, and so on, so you can look up reverse addresses. It's interpreted as a branching domain name of this strange domain. That's how it's uh, served up. All right, so here's how a DNS packet looks. You've got a header up here. This has got a transaction ID in it, and it tells you how many questions, how many answers, how many records telling you about the authority, and how many additional records there are in this packet. Then you tell it if the question is here, if it's an answer, there's a record here, if there's authority information, that's here, and if there's additional records, they're here. So your query would just have the question record, and your answer would typically repeat it all, repeat the question, and give you however many answers it was able to find. All right. And uh, the transaction ID is 16 bits, 2 bytes, which is in fact way too short, which is going to lead to a lot of security problems. Um, but that isn't, and then you have flags, like whether it's recursive or not, whether the answer is authoritative or not, and then you have some questions, some answers, some authority records, and some additional records, where it might be any variety of them. Um, all right, and so here's the flags. The queries specify query response, forward or reverse, recursive or iterative. Those are the options. All right. Now there is a weird problem with DNS. The original plan for DNS is that you would not, um, you'd put your start of authority in some other domain. The reason is, if you can't reach the start of authority, if I can't reach, if I'm trying to find, ccsf.edu, and I don't know what it is. Like, I'm a new company, I just bought the domain, I'm appearing on the internet for the first time. Nobody has any information about me in their caches. If the start of authority is ns3.ccsf.edu, it tries to find it, ask this guy, where is that? Ask this, it can't find it, task it. You've, you've got a kick it in the egg problem. It can't find your domain until it already knows where your domain is to ask the server where your domain is. So you can't get anywhere. So one, the original plan, I think, for the internet was to not allow this and force anybody to have their, their sort of authority somewhere else, have some server outside their domain. But that was not popular. Many people wanted to do this. They wanted to have all their servers on their domain, so they put up glue records. So at the top level domain, there is a huge database. Every time you buy a domain, they have to add a record to the top level domain database. It's kind of insane. Makes me feel bad about casually registering domains, but that's the way it is. So there's a glue record at the top that has a static IP address for your main server. So that when you ask the top level domain, where is this guy, they have an answer right from the start. That is something you cannot do. Only your domain registrar can do that. And I think doing an update at that level costs something like $500 per update. And this is why if you go to someplace like GoDaddy and buy a domain, they will tell you it might be like six hours before your domain will go live because we are not going to send an update for your record. We're going to pile them up until we have like 100 updates and then update them all at once so we don't have to pay so many of those $500 fees. And you can't do it at all. Only ISPs and large companies can do it. So you can view them with DIG. If you do DIG NS to find an EDU root server, you'll find the EDU server here. There's various ones of them, like ANG and so on. And once you've found a name server, you can DIG NS at there, and you will find um, question authority additional. I'm not sure where the glue record is. Let me see if I got another slide here. Um, I think, yeah, there it is. That one at the bottom is the NS3 going to an IP address. This is it. This tells you where City College's authoritative server is directly from the EDU servers. That's the glue record. 
It doesn't say glue, but that's what it is. Why does this EDU record know where CCSF.edu is without having to ask because of the glue record? It had to be put there. Without that, the whole internet would not work. So that's a game. That's how it works. Here's the IPv4 glue for Google. So I find a com server, because Google is a .com, and I find that .com is, in fact, run by .NET servers, which might seem screwy, but that's the way it is. And if I look for the name servers for Google, those servers, I will find, here they are, NS123 and 4 for Google have A records. Four glue records for Google up there. So that even if one of them goes down, the glue is there pointing to the others. And I should be able to find IPv6 glue servers for Google, but I haven't looked for them. All right. There's another one that's kind of cute, which is a bind version query. Originally, bind was the only DNS server anybody used. It was the first one, ran on Linux, sort of like Apache on the web. It was ubiquitous everywhere. And so you could dig, you could look for a chaos record, which is a text record for version.bind. And you would then be told what bind version you have, 9.3.5p1. Now this, I don't know why they ever set this up, and it's a terrible idea. If you do any security, you should never tell anybody what version you're running of anything. Because things come out, the vulnerability, like the Apache Struts vulnerability, and Bind had a ton of vulnerabilities. You shouldn't make it easy for bad guys to scan the internet and find your server and know it's vulnerable. So this thing doesn't work that much anymore. Most people that have any sense have turned this off or filled it with some random data so that you don't get the truth. And so this is one I did in 2015. Now if I do it at City College in 2016, it just says secured, which is the kind of thing you should do. You should take all the fields that tell people what version you're using of things and fill them with useless information, because there's no point handing that to attackers. It's not like normal visitors have any reason to care what version you're using of anything. All right, and here's isc.org, the authors of Bind. They still have it. They seem to be the last holdouts, of course, letting this happen. I don't know why they think anybody wants this, but they seem to think somebody might want it. All right, so if you're a small company, so you have some machines down here, and you have hubs and routers and switches, then you might just choose to outsource your DNS, like, like many people do. I've done it. I, my DNS is handled by Cloudflare. So um, out here, I just have a company. The ISP has some servers, and the hosting company. Down here, you rent host, put hosts someplace like, say, DigitalOcean. That's where mine are, some of them. Uh, so you rent a couple hosts at DigitalOcean, and they run DNS servers. And your ISP runs DNS servers. And so when people try to get to you, they ask um, uh, their ISP who you are, and their ISP will talk to this server and that, or this server, and they'll find it. But the point is, I don't run any servers. They're all done in the cloud by other people. This is a very common thing. More and more these days, if you're starting a company and you buy a server, you just made your first mistake. You should just put it in the cloud, on the Amazon cloud or the Google cloud or something. Then you don't waste your time fixing hardware and arranging backups and all that nonsense. Pay somebody else to do that. It's usually much more cost effective. Yeah. How much do you have to pay, like 10 bucks a month or 100? It's very cheap. If you go, you, if you don't need a lot of performance, Amazon will give you a one year free trial of minimum performance. You can run a server and post games or something for a year without paying anything. Um, after that, um, and if you go to um, DigitalOcean, I know you can get a server for five bucks a month. You're not getting a very powerful server, but it's enough to host something that isn't too popular, and you can just upgrade it later if you need to. You can't run a Bitcoin miner on it, though. I found that out. I had to upgrade up to 20 bucks a month to get a Bitcoin miner. Not that I recommend it. You can't make any money mining Bitcoin, but I wanted to do it to uh, see how it worked. So if you have a medium company, then you'll have all your servers. You'll have your public servers here, like your email servers and such. And then you'll have an internal network. And then you'll have, um, this is your DMZ with your public facing servers. And here's the internet. So what you ought to do is you ought to have an external DNS server which is accessible to everyone in the world, which only tells them about your public resources, like the web server and your email server. And then your private resources should be on the private server that is not available to the whole world. That is the right way to do it. A lot of small businesses make the mistake of running their own server and having only one server. So they mix public and private information on the same server. And that's not wise, because DNS servers are, everyone can get to them directly, just like they can get to your email server and your web server. And those things are targets of attack. They will usually get hacked frequently. 
because everybody can get directly to it and sooner or later somebody will put up an insecure PHP file or you'll have some vulnerability in some other product you're running that hasn't been patched in time and somebody will take it over and then you'll be sorry that you put anything on there you didn't want the whole world to know. So this is what you do. Your public server should only have public information so you don't care if they find out everything that's on that server. Anything private should be kept inside on the other side of a firewall that limits who gets in there. Presumably only the company employees. And for a large company, you really ought to have uh, geo distribution like Cloudflare, Yahoo, Google. These guys have servers all over the world, all over the country. And uh, they have techniques of distributing data among all of them so that people can get service everywhere because you have too much traffic going to a big company to all go to one place. So you have copies of it. One common solution is Akamai. Akamai runs content delivery network servers all over the place. This is, you may remember a scandal about 10 years ago, Microsoft, they said Microsoft is actually delivering their web page from Linux servers. And what fools they are. And what happened is Microsoft paid Akamai for delivery and Akamai uses Linux. So people who would query the server I'm loading Microsoft.com from would find it was a Linux server. It wasn't really that Microsoft was deliberately using Linux, but they had outsourced content distribution and most content distribution networks do run Linux for performance. Cloudflare does, I know a lot of them do. And so anyway, um, it is an issue. If you're going to be a worldwide company, you need to have servers all over the place. It's not enough to just have servers in one place. You want people in China to go to their local Chinese copy, people in Japan to go to their local Japanese copy. You don't want them all coming to California to get your web page. And then you can have a hierarchical architecture where you got end users and there are caching DNS servers, say, at each company location to handle it. And then there's another layer of caching DNS servers above them. And then up here, there's another one which sends recursive queries. So you have many layers. This is what a large ISP or something might do so that they have the cheapest solution to handle all the millions of queries from all their customers so everybody gets fast performance and we don't have to pay for any more servers or bandwidth than we need to. Um, and I mentioned before, uh, large things like the root of DNS and content distribution networks like Cloudflare use Anycast. So they will have a server at a certain address and they will have another server and another server all over the world with the same IP address all advertising themselves in border uh, gateway protocol. And they will, um, anybody that tries to go to them will ask, they will send a packet up and the routers will find the nearest one and send it there. So someone in this country will go to that one, someone in this country will go to that one. And if one of them goes down, border gateway patrol will automatically move all their data to another server. This is why you can't take down the dot servers and you can't take down Cloudflare because you cannot attack any one server. If you start sending a lot of traffic to one server, some of it will start going down here, and then some of it will start going down there. So until you have enough traffic to bring down the entire network, none of it will go down. So you can't attack just one server. You have to attack thousands of servers all at once. And the backbone does not have the ability to deliver a killing amount of traffic to that many machines at once. Cloudflare stops DOS attacks, and for the last several years, I've, they've been giving blog posts, and giving talks about the fact that the DOS attacks they've been seeing have reached the maximum amount of traffic that can be delivered to them by the internet. And they can handle that. So it's very difficult to find an attack that will bring them down. The only thing you can do is have an attack that's more intelligent than a volumetric attack, like a layer seven DOS that sends a special packet that freezes one service. And that's the kind of thing you have to patch and that doesn't happen that often. Anyway, I got another set of cahoots and we're just about at one hour. So I think it's fitting easily into the uh, time here. So it's 97284, a five-digit Kahoot. First one I've seen. All right. There's 16. Good. I'll wait a few seconds and see if that's going to go up. Looks like three people fell asleep. Okay. <laughs> we will carry on the survivors. Okay. What DNS record contains an IP version 4 address? All right, that's an A record, the most common record. Good. All right. What record contains the name of a DNS server?
All right, so that's name servers, and that's good, a popular answer. All right, what's in adder.arpa? What is that nonsense? All right, and that's reverse DNS. The most popular answer is correct. All right, when you open kahoot.it, what kind of query did your computer send? Okay, you send a recursive query. This is the common query, which means I just want the answer. Um, I say, you ask something like your router, where is Kahoot, and you don't, don't tell me you don't know. Go find out and get the answer. And you don't care who, who your router has to ask. That's the most common kind of query, is a recursive query for an end user. Yeah, when I put the wrong one. All right. Where are the glue records? They're on the top level domains, like .com and .net. That's where they are. Remember, we looked on the .edu server, and we found the glue record for ccsf.edu. All right. And uh, I think there's one more. What DNS record is used to stop spam? Okay, it's an SPF record, which is actually a text record, but it does contain the string SPF for sender policy framework. All right, I'm going to get results to get three winners, Equifax, AE, and Bill. And uh, it's AE is the new one. All right, so I just have a couple of administrative things to tell you. Uh, so here we are. At 9.12, the next class is in three weeks on October 3rd. Um, you'd have to do quiz two and a couple, next couple of projects by then. All the projects are down here, so you made a DNS server with Windows, and you'll make one with Linux. And then the, next, the third project is dig, where you just have to do digs like I did in class here to solve some issues. And so here I mentioned, if you don't for some reason have a dig that works on your machine because, for example, it's Windows or you're somewhere goofy like Starbucks where the internet is kind of fouled up, use the Ring of Saturn, or you can use their dig. And then you can just practice. Dig alone will give you the authoritative roots, which is just where the root servers are. And then um, you can dig at a server with dig at 8.8.8. .8 and then you can look for something like CCSF, resolving its address. So there's a series of practices you're just like I did in class, where you just do these things. And then to get your points, you have to solve some questions. Find the start of authority for me. Find an IPv4 for Juniper, an IPv6 for Google. Um, get an authoritative answer for where sans.org is. So you have to find their authoritative server and then dig at that server. So you'll get an authoritative answer, not just a copy of an answer, but the fundamental authoritative answer. And then um, go to IETF and find out how many signature records there are. You're looking for um, DNS SIG records to see how many records are signed. Those are the signatures. So anyway, you just answer these questions, and you include screen captures of images showing the query you did to find those answers. So this part up here is just practice. All right. And by the way, if you don't miss out on the extra credit projects, there's quite a few of them. Uh, you can turn on how to log. Once you've got your Windows server up, which you should already have, you can learn how to log the requests on the server. This is something you often want to do so you can track down problems and see where people are going. DNS crypt 
is an option on your Linux server, so you can encrypt the traffic on your local area network going to the server, which improves privacy. And there's a lot more things here, and next time we'll be talking more about source port randomization and poisoning the cache. You can get there, but part of the reason why you're using such an old Windows machine in this class, you're using an old, unpatched Windows Server 2008 without any service packs, and that is because that was vulnerable to the Kaminsky attack, which we'll be doing, and it got patched towards the end of 2008 when that attack became public. Uh, and we want to see the effect of the uh, unpatched machine and the effect of patching it. Anyway, any questions about anything? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned before uh, if we do all the extra credit, we have to do the final. Have to do what? Take the final is optional. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you get enough points, you can skip the final. And you, I started putting the scores up here, by the way. The first quiz is not added to this list, but you can see some people have started doing projects here. Somebody's done the first three and the first extra credit. So yeah, if you get enough points, and if you if you take the quizzes, you should do pretty well because they're open book and everything. If you take the quizzes and do the projects and do the extra credit projects, you probably have no reason to take the final. You probably have an A without taking the final. That's what a lot of people do. But the final is always something you can take if you want to, just for completeness or because you didn't do enough projects and you want to finish the grade that way. Um, I, I do it this way because I didn't enjoy finals exam as much as a student. I'd rather do my projects, and that's a pretty common. If you do these other things on the board, by the way, the worst extra credit, if you go to, out of, to training events like these talks, or you go to participate in a CTF, that's worth extra points. So that's another thing you can do. Any kind of off-campus training is good. If you go to meetups or something, they're worth points. Any other questions? You want right off for the CTF? Uh, well, even just doing it at all, I'd give you some points, but if you actually solve the problem, I'd give you more. And write-ups would be good, yeah. Yeah, write-ups would certainly be the best thing. I haven't been enforcing it, but if you get enough interest in CTFs, I'm glad you pointed out. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll recommend that more. Anyway, um, I'm going to go clean up here, and I'll go up to the lab in Science 214. If anybody wants to work here, I'll be around for a while to help you. Oh, but I think most people... Are there guest speakers this semester coming in? There's two of them. Uh, you'll see tomorrow and the next day, there's two of them coming. Not in this class, probably, though. Not with those six, six meetings. The only person I'd probably bring in here is Dan Kaminsky if he came, but he's usually too busy. First time I ran the class, he was sort of excited and he thought about coming, but, you know, he's, he's a rock star. He's running companies and testifying before Congress and everything else. It's hard to get him to come talk to a college class. Yeah? Um, okay, so you said Tim Ryan is coming uh, tomorrow, basically. Yeah. Is uh, an extra credit for that one? Yeah. And what, what is the... Uh, is that root club? Boot Cloud is some kind of startup to do cloud security. And I'm not entirely sure what they do. They're going to show it to us. And they're going to maybe give us a chance to like set it up in the lab and see it go or something. Oh, okay. So, we'll it yeah, you go to them, they're worth extra credit, and we'll learn something.